sometimes people will say, like, we're Muslims, we have the Quran, we have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why are we not on the top? Why are we not the best in the world? Why is these things happening? What's going on? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this hadith number two. Abu Huraira reported that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ummati hadihi ummatun marhuma, laysa alayha adabun fil akhira, adabuha fil dunya, al fitan was al al qatl. So he said, This my nation, ummati hadihi, ummatun marhuma. You see it. My nation, ummati, right, is a nation that has mercy on it. Mercy, marhuma, right, from rahma. Its punishment is not in the hereafter, but its punishment is in the dunya, in this world. Fitan, zalazul, qatal. Fitan is the plural of fitna, which is a trial, a temptation, a gray area, a confusion. And zalazul is the earthquakes, and qatal is murder. So when you look at this now, it's in Abu Dawud ibn Majah and Ahmed, slightly different forms, very important hadith to understand what's going on. What's happening to us is actually a mercy. It's a wake-up call. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waking us up from a deep sleep. Okay? What is, because the punishment, it's not going to be in the next life, meaning... The punishment is here. In other words, your, your, our, our wake-up call is right here. And it will be fitna. There will be trials, temptations, confusion. Right? This is part of a wake-up call, right? There will also be natural disasters, earthquakes, right? And many of these earthquakes in the past 20 years or so have hit Muslim countries. Look at the list of them. Look at the tsunamis and whatnot, and earthquakes. Okay, and murder, and now we see it. Of all the people in the world, Muslim blood right now, it means nothing to, to, the, to, to, to people. Right? Look at the press. Look what happens. Every day, how many hundred die in Afghanistan? These one die in Syria. This one dies in Iraq. This one dies in Somalia. This one dies in Mindanao in the Philippines. This, you know, Muslim, I mean, uh, over a million Uyghur Muslims in China are in prison, are in concentration camps. Could you imagine if 100,000 Europeans were in concentration camps? Could you imagine if 1,000 Canadians were in concentration camps, being tortured? What would happen? You see? So this is our punishment and it is to wake us up. And this has happened to us at different points in Islamic history. And this, I believe, where, where we're going now, there's, there's something big, major coming next. Just about all of the minor signs of Qiyamah have been completed. Only thing that appears to be left of the major is the Mahdi. That literally one will be raised up but oppression is going to be intensified on us until the reaction comes. Allah knows best when it's going to actually happen. But we do know it is what we call sunnatullah. It is the way of Allah. And I go back, and it's important for you, many of you have studied this, but I always go back when I look at our situation to the 13th century of the Common Era when uh, the Muslim world was widespread and um, Baghdad was the richest city on earth. And Muslims were divided into nation states, right, all on their own. The Khalifa was symbolic. He was a, a young guy and he just played most of the time with roses and writing poetry. Right, his army was only like 12,000. Is supposed to be the ruler of the Muslim world, right? And the, the ulama were paid a tiny amount of money. They said the slave of the Khalifa, Allah ad-Din al-Tabarasi, his crops 
brought about 300,000 dinars per year. This is the slave of the Khalifa. And the ulama are only getting like 50 you know, dinars per month. Right? That one of the scholars, Ibn al Lathir, he said around this time of the explosion, um, there was no hujjaj from Baghdad to Mecca. Nobody went, no hajj group. Because they said they didn't have time to make hajj. So nobody went from Baghdad to Mecca. And it's the richest city in the world, right? It's not that far either, right? And it's at that time that they came in conflict with a nation far to the northeast, uh, the northeast of Asia. And they insulted some of their merchants and killed some of their people. And the leader of this group, whose name was Genghis Khan, he said, there's only one sun in the sky and there's only one Khan on this earth. Right? And he unleashed his people on the Muslim world, unleashed them. And you read the story of what Mongols did. You will not believe it. You think it's a fantasy. It cannot be real. Okay, what they, what they did. And the biggest problem was our disunity, all the things that we were doing to each other, right? The weaknesses. This is a punishment unleashed on us. Serious punishment. And, he, and his forces continued going through, killing hundreds and thousands of people, right? Moving from city to city. And when he came to Baghdad, and the writer is reporting that um, they surrounded Baghdad and the Khalifa was listening to his favorite belly dancer. So she was dancing and he was enjoying it, right? And they shot an arrow and it went through the curtains in the Khalifa's castle and it killed his belly dancer. This is in a report. Okay? Now, wh what would you do? He said, take her out of there, get me another belly dancer. This is a state of insanity, right? Your city is surrounded like that. It's, it's total insanity. It's like somebody on drugs, right? And the Mongols, as you know, destroyed Baghdad, you know, killed uh, millions, destroyed the books. And when they were about to destroy the rest of the Muslim world and to go into Mecca and Medina, then Saif al-Din Qutuz rahimahullah of, of the Mamluks of Egypt, he united the Muslims and they defeated the Mongols in Ain Jalut, which is in Jordan. They defeated them there. They were on their way to Mecca and Medina. They defeated them and they drove them back. And some of the Mongols, when they saw Muslims standing up, they started taking Shahada and becoming Muslim. Right? And then Islam spread amongst even the Mongols. They became the Mughals of India, right? And it started to spread. And that period of time under the Mamluks is one of the golden ages of Islamic literature. Many of the scholars you know, Ibn Kathir, and many scholars you know, many of the books are, is in Mamluk period. Right after the destruction, right? It was a golden age. Okay, so this is a reality. We need to reflect on our situation.